Well, I think my greatest mistakes are, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny on a stock, all you can lose is 100%. I've done that. But your great mistakes is selling a good company and then doubles, then it triples and quadruples because you make a lot of mistakes. And so it's ones that go up tenfold, like on the 10 baggers. So some of my mistakes are just saying, oh my God, this stock is too high. And I was wrong. And you had to figure out what inning am I in this baseball game? I sold Toys R Us way too early. It went up 20 fold after I sold it. I did the same thing at Home Depot. Those are probably my two greatest mistakes I ever made. Hey, I'm Steven and this is Solving the Money Problem. If you're new, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. So many of you will have heard of legendary investor Peter Lynch. For those of you who haven't, he managed the Magellan Fund for a period of 13 years and absolutely smoked everybody else in the industry, achieving about a 30% annualized return over that period. Incredible. Clearly, Peter did something right over that 13 year period. So in this video, I'm gonna to react to a few clips and add a few comments where I think it's relevant of Peter discussing stocks and the market and some of his investment philosophies and strategies around the time of the global financial crisis. His words of wisdom still apply today. So let's get into the video. But first, hey guys, if you're in the US and you'd like three free stocks, yes, one, two, three free stocks, check out the link in the description to Weeble. Open a new account and fund it with $100 and you'll get three free stocks, two of them valued up to $1,600. And if you're in Australia, the UK or New Zealand, you can get a free stock with stake also using the link in the description. Let's get back to it. And just for fun, before we dive in, I just wanna show you guys what would have happened if you'd invested $100,000 under Peter's management over that 13 year period and got approximately a 30% annualized rate of return. One year, two years, three years, four years, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Yes, a hundred thousand dollars under Peter's management over that 13 year period would have grown to about three million. This is called credibility and it is extremely important whenever you're hearing anybody sharing their thoughts and opinions, ask yourself the question. Are they credible? And then the follow-up question, how credible are they? Peter, many viewers want to know whether this market is totally different, whether your old view that people should find, buy, and hold good stocks is no longer applicable. What do you think? I think the same rules applied 50 years ago, applied five years ago, apply 20 years from now. You, first of all, you have to know what you own, whether it's a fund or a stock, and you have to have a reason for it. And you ought to be able to explain to an 11-year-old in two minutes or less, why own it? And, and this sucker's going up is not a good reason. I've tried that one. It's not a, doesn't work. This is an incredibly important point from Peter. Now it's true. You can own a good company for bad reasons. And I think many people own Tesla stock for poor reasons. They've seen somebody on YouTube talk about it. They like Elon Musk. They like the products. They like the vehicles. That's great. Some of their friends own Tesla stock. Yeah, cool. That's good enough for me. But herein lies the problem. When the shit hits the fan, when the unexpected happens, when the stock doubles overnight, the people that don't have really good reasons for owning the stock are likely to make very poor decisions like selling the stock when they believe over the long term the company's gonna do well, but they don't have a clear roadmap in their mind of how they're actually gonna get there. People who've spent the time to really intimately understand a company and therefore a stock are much more likely to make better decisions. Now, you can make a good decision and be wrong, that's fine. But more information, more understanding, more reasoning, more analysis, more clarity is always a good thing. So make sure if you own stocks in your portfolio, you have very good reasons for owning them. Otherwise, you're prone to make some pretty poor decisions around those stocks as well. Shout out to everybody who panic sold in February, March, April, May, June, July, etc. And also shout out to everybody who sold Tesla stock, not because something fundamental changed about the company, but because the stock price did something unexpected and well, that wasn't part of my thinking and therefore I'm scared, daddy, please hold me. I think I might sell my shares. Given the recent and unprecedented price surge of Tesla stock over the last few days, I felt like this would be worth addressing so we could discuss what's going on, why the price has gone up about 40% over the last few days and why I decided to sell half of my Tesla holdings this morning at $912 a share. Split adjusted, that is $182 per share. Hmm. Ouch. Because at least for me, that's a pretty big deal considering I'm the type of investor who never likes to sell anything. I'm a very firm believer in the buy and hold investment strategy and not trying to time the market. Not to mention, I don't typically invest in individual stocks. Even with Tesla, my intention was to hold it a very, very, very long time because I believe in the company. Not sell off half of my portion in less than a year from when I first bought it. But when I see gigantic movements in price like we saw today, and because I don't really know why I bought the stock, I get scared. I can't help but want to lock in at least some of my profit. Now, I'm not here to pick on Graham Stiff, and in fact, I really admire the guy. He's a brilliant real estate investor and he's built a phenomenal YouTube brand as well. Nothing but respect. But if we're being honest, it's probable that Graham Stephan didn't have great reasons for owning Tesla stock. Despite the fact that he says he's a buy and hold long-term investor, 
He sold after Tesla stock shot up 40%, not because the fundamentals of the company changed, but something weird happened to the stock price. And this is the kind of decision making you'll see from people that don't have extreme conviction in their stock positions. What would you say to investors now who say, Peter, everything I own's gone down. Uh, it's been going down now for a couple of years. Right. People keep saying we're at a bottom. Right. Uh, should I get out and go into CDs or gold bars and, and opium or whatever? Right, right. Well, basically, you look now. You have three choices. I think if, if you're an investor, you can put your money in a money market fund and get one seven, one five, one six, and, and it's taxed at a forty percent rate. Or you can buy a ten-year treasury and get four seven, and that's taxed at a forty percent rate. Or you can have some equities. And I think stocks over the next 10 years will do a lot better than 4.7 or 1.7. So I would have some of my money. Now, it's up to the person to decide how much they want to have in the stock market. For some people, 10% is aggressive. For some people, 50% is the right amount. It's a personal decision. And you can't go by these rules that if you're 25, you should be 100%. And if you're 45, you should be 50%. And if you're 60, you should be zero and is burping a lot. I don't know what the rules are on people at 60, but they, that, I hate those rules. I think they're pathetic. This is a brilliant point from Peter. I think the truth is the vast majority of people who want to invest by these rules, or oh, you should put 20% in this, 30% in this, or if you're this age, do this. If you're th These are people who don't have confidence in their own decision-making abilities and would rather outsource that to somebody else. Oh, well, the consensus says I should do this, so I'll do this. That makes me feel safe. I've never been one to follow rules or give a single fuck about what other people think about me or anything else. Sure, it's useful information to get somebody else's perspective, but I never allow that to shade, color, or determine my own thoughts and my own actions. I'll take it on board, assess, but I'll never use that as guidance for what I should do. In fact, many of you guys and girls will know the vast majority of my stock portfolio is in one stock, Tesla, over 96% of my stock portfolio by value. Now that's not my entire net worth, but it certainly is a large percentage. Most of you would have a heart attack doing something similar, but you're not me. Why are you confident that stocks will be a lot higher in 10 years? Well, they're not lottery tickets. I mean, when you own a stock, it's a share of a company, and I think companies are going to make a lot more money in 10 years, a lot more money in 20 years, and that's, that's why they go up. That's the only reason. Some companies don't do well. Zero Hux is making a lot less money than they did 30 years ago. It's a lot less. But a lot most, more companies are earning a lot more money than they were, and that's why stocks go up. Corporate profits have gone up 40-fold since World War II. Stock market's up 40-fold. Do you guys notice that Peter Lynch there is talking about 10-year, 20-year time horizons on stock investments? This, in my opinion, is how all investors should be thinking about their investments long term. If you don't invest for really long periods of time, in my opinion, you are not an investor. You're either a fool if you think you're an investor, or you're a gambler if you recognize that you're in the casino gambling, not investing. What are the most conspicuous mistakes you've seen investors make? Well, I think not looking at the balance sheet, and this is a mistake I've made. If you look at, you know, if you look at a person's balance sheet, you look to see what the assets they own, their houses, if they own a house, if they own a car, what debt they have, and take that away, that's what your net worth is. You should do that with a company. And I've seen, I've seen investors look at companies that made, let's say looking at two companies, they're very depressed. They're each at $4 a share. But one company's, and they're each losing a couple million dollars a quarter. One company is $100 million in cash and no debt. And one company has no cash and $100 million in debt. They're about to blow taps on the second company. So you ought, and you could do this. You, if you get through eighth grade math and you get anywhere near 8 and 8 equals 16, you can do this. Look at a company's financial position. It's impossible to go bankrupt if you don't have any debt. I mean, you get the Irving G. Thalberg Lifetime Achievement Award. I think they're a bad man. I mean, how could you do that? Speaking of debt, some of you guys and girls might find this particular graphic rather interesting. The numbers are from earlier this year. Not a huge amount has changed since. We can see here Tesla with $13.4 billion of debt, Ford over 10 times that amount, VW over $200 billion of debt. And the rather concerning and scary part if you look into the balance sheets of these legacy automakers, you'll discover that a huge amount of this debt is secured against leases against internal combustion engine vehicles that aren't autonomous whose values are going to fall off a cliff in the next few years. This isn't a house of cards. This is a whole neighborhood of cards ready to collapse. When you were actively managing money, you were presumably were under the same pressures as other fund managers to show performance results. Right. Did that incline you to sell too quickly sometimes? Well, I think my greatest mistakes are, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny, on a stock, all you can lose is 100%. I've done that. But your great mistakes is selling a good company, and then it doubles, then it triples, and it quadruples. Because you make a lot of mistakes, and so it's ones that go up tenfold. I call them the ten baggers. So some of my mistakes are just saying, oh, my God, this stock is too high, and I was wrong. And you had to figure out, what inning am I in this baseball game? I sold Toys R Us way too early. It went up 20-fold after I sold it. I did the same thing at Home Depot. 
Those are probably my two greatest mistakes I ever made. Once again, we come to the subject of selling stocks too soon. One of the things that I did when I was first starting out investing, before I bought my first piece of real estate, I asked a lot of investors online, especially and at some investor meetups, they were mostly real estate investors, what's your biggest investing mistake? And almost unanimously, I was told across the board, almost identical responses, I bought this, I sold it for this, I doubled my money, I tripled my money, but now it's worth 10 times that much. I should have kept it. Same story over and over and over. So I've learned from a very early stage before I actually began investing myself that I don't want to have regrets. Therefore, I need to have really good reasons for owning assets and a plan, a strategy, a thesis. So I can check if something changes, if the reality changes, if the future changes, if my predictions, my assumptions are wrong, then my thesis has changed, that's okay. But unless something fundamental changes, I know what I'm doing, that's guiding me to hold those assets over the longer term as part of my long-term investment thesis, my plan. If you have good reasons a good thesis, a result of that should be a good clear plan which is going to guide you through your decisions over the long term. When should you sell? Well, you ought to find out why you bought a stock. If you're saying it's a cyclical company and they're doing poorly and they're doing awful, you wait till things are getting better and they're doing terrific and then you sell it. But with a growth company, you have to say, Walmart's case, 10 years after they went public, you could have bought the stock and made 500 times your money. You say, still are only in 15% of the United States. And you, they could say, why can't they go to 17? Why can't they go to 19? Why can't they go to 23? So for the next four decades, they went around the country. So you have to say to yourself, in this stock, I have a 10-year story, a 20-year story. I'll be able to write that down and follow that. And that's what I do with the company. And that's your decision. That's how you sell it. Absolutely spot on. Really driving this point home, you have to have a long-term vision of why you own this company, and that is going to guide your decision making. You buy a company to grow. And if it's a textile company or it's an electronics company or a software company, you better understand what they do. And, and if they do well, the stock will do well, no matter what happens to the market. Another brilliant point from Peter here. Just earlier this year, we saw the entire stock markets globally collapse after the pandemic. Everyone freaked out. We saw shares down 30, 40, 50 plus percent. At that time, I observed in a few videos, hey guys, I noticed that Tesla stock has fallen by approximately the same amount as airline stocks have fallen. Um, don't want to don't make too many assumptions here, but uh, do you think that makes sense? considering the whole people won't be traveling for a long time, but Tesla will still be producing vehicles and EVs are taking over and they're gonna gain market share. Just, does that make sense to you? I really wanna underscore this point. What this stock market does has absolutely nothing to do with the particular stocks that you own. That has 100% to do with what those particular companies are doing within their industries. Big distinction. For example, the entire stock market has fallen off a cliff, but you know that the companies in particular that you know their business is still fundamentally improving, growing, getting even better, that you don't have to worry about what the market is doing. All you need to worry about is what are the companies doing whose stock you actually own. If the Dow Jones today was 1,000 or 500, you would have made a lot of money in McDonald's. You would have made a lot of money in Johnson Johnson. You would have made a lot of money in Gillette. These companies' earnings have gone up a lot the last 30 years. And if the market was 50,000, you would have lost money in Burlington Industries. I recommended that in 1969. I think it's... I think it's gone from 34 to 2 with no stock splits because the earnings have been terrible. Well, your modesty actually makes an important point, which is people with the best batting averages in the world don't bat 1,000. Yeah. I sometimes get angry mail, particularly during bear markets, saying so-and-so yeah. recommended yeah. such and such and it went down. Yeah. Well, uh, how often did you come up with a clinker? Well, this, this is a funny business. You don't have to be right even five times out of ten. If the times you're right, you make a double and triple. It offsets all those times you lose 20 or 30 percent. So when you buy a stock, you ought to say to yourself, how much can I lose and how much can I make? And you ought to be able to make a lot. You see, stocks are risky. I mean, look, look at how much we lost on AT&T. Look at how much we lost on Xerox. These were quality companies. You know, you could lose a lot in a stock. So you've got to say to yourself, how much can I make? Because I want to buy a stock. If I'm right, I'm going to make a double or triple. Does your own confidence ever get shaken? Every day I think the market's going to go up. You know? <laughs> I keep calling a lot of my companies. So I keep calling the companies. You once said to me that you spent all your time looking at companies analyzing them as businesses, and you didn't spend a lot of time worrying about the economy. Do you have a view on the economy now? Well, I, I look at the economy. I look historically at the economy. I don't look at the future. I mean, that's weather forecasting. I look, I look at the economy backwards, see what's happening. And the economy looks very good to me right now. The housing market looks terrific. I mean, the, the auto market looks good. The consumer looks good. There's a lot of good elements to it. And if this is, we've had nine recessions since World War II, and they've averaged usually about a 2% decline in the workforce. You know, it's terrible. There's about a million and a half people have lost their jobs in this decline. But that would only be about a 1% decline in the workforce. So, so far, this has been a mild recession. It has been mild in technology. It has been mild in telecom. It has been mild for, you know, if the company's making fiber optics. 
But it's been a, it's been a normal recession, and I would never bet against the American economy. It's powerful. Peter, Lou asked you a question about sort of the typical investor mistakes. And, and when you started in the business, I know the average investor held mutual funds for you right. know, 16, 17 years, and now it's down to less than two years. Right. Do you think that's one of the problems if time horizon's gotten too short? Well, I think also uh, what they, might, they have to say, what do I want? Do I need the money in a year? Do I need the money in five years? You're a terrible investor. You need the money in a year. I mean, if you need it for college to send your kids there or for a wedding, you're not going to be a good investor. Then you have to do some homework and say, should I have 10 growth funds? That's silly. You say, what do I want? I want two or three growth funds. What's my mix I like? And you want to say it is aggressive. You know, some people aggressive is 50%. So I would say people, and some people might want to have foreign funds. It's like a menu at a restaurant. They should look it over and decide what they like, and then stay with it. And if one group does well for two or three years, the next bunch of money they add to, maybe they should add to the group that's underperforming. Over time, different categories work out to be about the same. So you, you get whipsawed. If you're all in one area, does poorly for three years, you say, get me out of that, and you go into some other area, and that does badly for three years, you, you could be in it forever and never make money. I think this is a great place to wrap this video up. Once again, coming back to that long-term vision, not trying to time the market, not moving in and out of assets because you don't have good reasons for owning them. Having a clear plan that's based on reasoning and analysis, checking back in with that and using that to guide your long-term investment decisions. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan. This is Solving the Money Problem, and I love you all. And don't forget, if you're in the US and you'd like three free stocks, check out the link in the description to Weeble. Open a new account and fund it with $100 and you'll get three free stocks, two of them valued up to $1,600. And if you're in Australia, the UK or New Zealand, you can get a free stock with stake also using the link in the description. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you have any ideas for future videos, let me know. I read all your comments. P.S. If you're still watching, you're awesome. If you'd like early access, exclusive videos, regular Q and A's, our private Discord server, and more. Consider supporting the channel at Patreon.com/solvingthemoneyproblem so I can keep creating content for you guys. There's a link in the description. You can now also become a member of the channel for some exclusive perks. To learn more, click the join button next to subscribe, and don't forget to check out our merch store. Either way, the best form of support is you being here and watching. So thanks again.